What kind of example is Christ giving to us, Jew and Gentiles? That's what we're going to talk about today in Romans 15. So we continue the letter. We're almost towards the end of it. And Roman is saying that we have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Oh, no. What is the weak? But not please ourselves. You know, I think it's very easy for us to get haughty, you know, about ourselves. I'll tell you an interesting thing is when I first became a Christian, I mean, I was like probably the first week, there was someone in my church who, I don't know, did things I thought were outside the bounds. And they probably were. But I thought, how is it that all these people are sinning? I just came into faith. This is so exciting to me. I love this life inside of Christ. He loves us. We love him. People be doing this. And it's easy to look at people and cast judgment. It really is. And Paul is telling us not to do that. I mean, Christ said not to be haughty, not to be arrogant, not to have pride, all those things. But this is going to be a different kind of message because, again, Paul is trying to bring a church together. So he says, let's each of us please his neighbor for good. Build him up. Let's do these things so that it can be you know, beneficial to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you reproach other people, if you, if you condemn them and all these kinds of things, you're going to be condemned. You know, we've heard that. Have mercy if you want mercy. Do forgiveness if you want forgiveness. Well, if you reproach, you get reproachment. I don't know. You get something reproaching and you're not, you don't want that. So he said that in these days, we were encouraged so that we would have hope in God, you know, through the scriptures. That's going to be the Old Testament. And God wants us to have endurance and encouragement and harmony with each other. We want to be one in voicing, he said, glory to God the Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ and to welcome one another just as Christ welcomed us. And we would say, well, look here, he said the word be one. So shouldn't everyone believe me? Because he said the word one. So isn't the one my one? I don't think it's really quite that easy in that because we don't know every issue. We certainly don't know how the one is. Think of it more in one in Jesus Christ, not one in my opinions. As soon as you go down that road, now you're going to be encroached upon. And so Christ, he said, had hope for both the Jews and Gentiles. I mean, Jesus did say first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, and that he was coming back and he was going to save his nation. The Jewish people had faith for all these years since the beginning of time. They were the light bringing God's word everywhere around the place. Daniel brought it to Babylon, you can see. And now he hasn't abandoned his people and he hasn't abandoned the Gentiles either. He wanted mercy for us too. And he goes on to quote Second Samuel that will talk, rejoice all you Gentiles with his people. We're going to be one together. And that's from Deuteronomy. So it's not just the prophets, which the Sadducees didn't like. It's also the the Torah. So all these things, that these messages. So Paul goes through all these messages where the Gentiles are coming and that the Gentiles would have hope in Jesus. And that's exactly what happened. So he hopes that we're filled with joy and peace and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul even says to himself that he has been a minister to Gentiles. Like I said, it's so wild in God's world because you think, this is the thing I'm going to do. This is the thing I have expertise in. And God says, you know, I have a different idea. Paul would have been an excellent person, you think, to go talk to the Jewish people because he knows so much about it. He has such a history about it. Instead, he ended up being that voice to the Gentiles, and he understood them in a way that he could explain it. He talked to them, Mars Hill, places that they would know, and as an educated person, he would know, but he probably had to come out of his uh, stretchy box a little bit because he knew the Pharisees. He knew life as a Pharisee, and suddenly he's traveling the world, talking to a group of people he probably didn't really talk to before. He probably didn't want to talk to before if he had to actually do it. But he gives them encouragement. I'm satisfied that you're doing goodness, that you're filled with knowledge and able to instruct each other, teach each other. And these ways I'm writing to you about is because God's grace was given to me by God. 
and told me to be a minister to the Gentiles, a, a service of the gospel, offering Gentiles this word so that they could come and believe in Christ and follow Jesus, just like some of the initial believers who were Jewish believed in Jesus. And he's proud of his work, he says. Not proud, like, didn't proud, but you know that in Jesus, his work is been good because the Holy Spirit gave him the things to say and that Christ accomplished these things through him. He's not taking credit in this. He says this is all done by obedience, word and deed, signs and wonders, power of the Spirit, all these things that God gave him. He was able to go travel all over the place and fulfilling the mission of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he wants to preach it and build on this foundation. And again, if you're a faith that cares about your believers and not just stepping on their necks and forcing you to believe in their faith, you teach them, you coach them, you bring them up, you build them up. And that's what Paul's saying. You know, I've done that. And it's all been through Jesus that this work has been done. And he says that it's why I haven't been able to come to you. We're back to the beginning of the letter. I wanted to go to Rome. I couldn't go to the Rome. I don't have room. Meaning like his schedule. His schedule is so busy. I can't even have room to work in these regions because I've been so many years in these other places building up these churches. So he's hoping that he'll get a chance to go to Rome as he goes to Spain. There's no record that he ever did go to Spain. So I think this was a hope. Probably never been to Spain, but he hoped to go there. And he says that, you know, on his journey, then he will enjoy his, their company. But right now, He's going to Jerusalem and bringing aid to the saints. We're talking about all the apostles who are still there in Jerusalem. And if we recall from Acts, they were having a huge famine. The church needed help. And the other churches responded. See that happening still today. We are there for each other, for the most part. And a church that is struggling under the temple structure, under that leadership. And so he has to go back and help them. And it's been nice because we heard about this in Acts where people in Greek, Macedonia and Archaea that were donating and helping the people who were poor among the saints in Jerusalem. I mean, I'm sure if you're in that temple structure, you're right there at ground zero. You're probably not going to find work. You're probably going to find persecution under the Romans. You're probably going to have your tax returns audited every year. It's going to be hard for you to live there. So these people in Greece helped out the church that's happening in Jerusalem. And they were happy to do it. In fact, he said they even owed them to do it because they were the beginnings of this church. And so if the Gentiles have come in being able to share their blessings and help donate money to the church, if all this works out, he says, I'm going to go to Spain, but on the way there, I'm going to come visit you and get the fullness of the blessing of Christ. And so he says, by Jesus and the love of the Spirit, strive together with me in your prayers. Come together, be a church, so that he can be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, the temple structure, the people who were against him, and that his service in Jerusalem will be acceptable to the saints, meaning the other apostles in this particular case. But I think he's also referring to the other believers, the believers that are in Jerusalem. Someday I got to find the definition of saints. What exactly does it mean when you say someone's a saint? I think a lot of times it's a, kind of an ambiguous term. When we're talking about the saints, we're talking about the apostles. But when we're talking about the saints of Christ, I think it means the church as a whole. And then when he comes to it, it's going to be joyous. We're all going to be refreshed. And so may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. That's ESV. So he gives them a prayer. We got one more chapter left, so it's not the end. But He's really looking forward to seeing them. And we learn in Acts what happens when he gets to Judea. So he's going to get tied up by the temple structure. We're going to see Roman leaders putting him in house prison almost to save him from the people in Jerusalem. And so that's why he probably never makes it to Rome or Spain on his own will. What I'm going to meditate on is this idea that we should live in peace. Again, I talked about it last time that we should be together, and that the, just like the Jewish people have a place in this church, we're the very first apostles in this church, 
So do the Gentiles. The Gentiles have a place. And not only did the Gentiles have a place, but it has been this way from the beginning of time. There is no them versus we. God always wanted to bring the Gentiles back in. So if you're on the other side and a Jewish believer, there's nothing against adopted sons. Adopted sons are sons. Adopted daughters are daughters. What I'm going to pray about is that, again, we, we come together as a church, that we don't look at anything that puts us up higher, lower, puts disdain on each other. I remember when I was in Israel, there was a group of people coming into Israel and people were, and I'm not saying this is a Jewish thing. I think this is a, a common to man thing. Oh, they're not a part of us. They say they're Jewish, but they're not a part of us. And I got a chance to meet quite a few of them because my archaeological dig hired people from this area that were brought in. And you know what? They were as Jewish as anyone I met in Israel. There was no question in my mind they were, in fact, Jewish. And so I thought, oh, it's so sad that you just think of a person's background and you think, well, they can't be like me. Let's hope and pray together that we always bring ourselves together into one church, in one voice. If we do that, we can be such a strength to each other. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that regardless of your background, regardless of where you came from, we are in this together absolutely in this together. Anyway, I hope this has been good for you. Thank you so much for listening. Please remember, A Better Life in Small Steps is my home for all my podcasts. I have a nature podcast. I have some productivity podcasts. If you have anything that you want to say to me, you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening.